Hey everyone, this is Rob uh, recording alone because the episode that you're about to hear was recorded a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we're currently in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. And for everyone who is not already, make sure that you're doing your part to social distance. Make sure that you are doing your best to uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, just love each other and be as kind to one another as possible. And you're, we're going to be good for the next couple of weeks. We have three episodes just locked and loaded. So if you are worried about missing us, don't worry. We, we've got at least a, a good three weeks before we've got to start worrying about episodes and whatnot. But luckily, we can probably just do some remote recording if necessary. But with that said, let's get right into the episode and we'll see you guys soon. Hello, friends. Welcome to World Build With Us, the podcast where we create fantastical worlds with help from you, our listeners. I'm Rob Hilferty, and I am joined with Exarch of Exotic Cheeses and Dates, Chris Prunty. Ooh. <laughs> We're also joined by our continued special guest, Daniel Quinn. Gentlemen, good to have you back. On today's episode, we're talking about the quill, the mysterious symbiotic race that is totally not a parasite and are not totally not, parasite. they're not parasites. But today we're doing our second racial deep dive into the quill. We're going to be going over their cultural practices, different variants of the quill, and some important locations for the quill themselves. So Chris, because the quill are more or less your baby, I was hoping that you could give a refresher on who the quill are, what their deal is, and why they're not parasites. Well, one, they're not parasites because they live in uh, in a joint with their host. It's not something that they're... Both are getting some sort of benefit. The quill gets the fact that you have a host that has limbs and uh, a, a means of speaking, whereas the quill themselves are kind of insectoid, beetle-looking things. And not a lot of advantageous things to being a beetle for making tools and such. But they do live long, and so their experience, they can pass on to their holes. And prosper. Hate you. Mm. But, uh, yeah, in a way, they were the love letter to uh, Drax. What was the name of Drax? Jadzia Dax? Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, yeah, I also liked uh, the Gwauld uh, and... I just like parasitic races, not parasitic races. <laughs> I said Symbiotic it. It's races. all coming together now. <laughs> Damn it. He is a quill. I knew it. <sighs> yeah, he's no, he's not a quill. He's a quill apologist, oh, which is even right. worse. But yeah, I also like the fact that I I didn't want them to be parasites because I wanted it to be that people already should distrust them. I feel like there should be plenty of people who are just like, all right, who's talking to me? You or that beetle? And also. Even if you knew the person for their entire life, once they join with the quill, the experience, the the combining of two minds, their personality would change enough that someone could argue it just like, you're not who I know. How did it, In Star Trek, how did it work with the Trill? Were they like separate personalities or were they like a new one? I always forget. They made it as if uh, each one was a new personality because uh. I could have remembered one time where... Uh, they would reference old man and uh -huh. say, that. "Oh, right," yeah. and it'd be like, "I'm not that person anymore. Uh -huh. I'm just." So with the quill, just, yeah. there's still the two are there plus the new one, correct? Essentially, yeah. So, gentlemen, who wants to get going with some nuanced practices of the quill? One of the practices that I had come up with the quill was a coming of age thing. So I wanted it to be around the time that they have spent enough uh, time in their base form before they would be joined with another. This way that they would have time to develop a little bit of their own personality rather than just being grafted onto another person. And then whoever their first host would be is also kind of very paramount to who they would join to. So I wanted it to actually be that sometimes the coming of age ceremony that they do, they get grafted to someone who's towards the end stage of life. Oh, weird. Okay. How much of their personality gets imprinted because of the first person they tend to, uh, what's, what's the word that we're looking for here? Bind with, you mean? Bind or combine or attach to or... Join with. Fusion. 
confused with. It's not Fusion Ha, no. No. It's because it's not a fusion. It's like, well, well, what is it? What is it called? I, I, a partnership, binding. By sure, we'll go with binding. Mm-hmm. That's fine. Stapling. Pretty, yeah, exactly staples, like that. I mean, see, that's what I think of when you when I think yeah. of a binding. You're like you're not. Oh. It's not. It's not a gentle or a kind thing. Oh, grafting. Grafting is uh, it's even grosser. No, no, but I'm pretty sure that's the uh, flesh. <laughs> the flesh pits is what you're going well, you for. You know, there. like grafting plants together. You, unite with. Mm, I kind of like unite, but um, whatever. If you're trying to avoid the prisoning. Did we say fuse? Can we just go with yeah, fuse? fuse. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, fuse is fine. Mm-hmm. I know I made the Dragon Ball joke, but that's fine. All right, so I'm sorry. Continue. So I wanted it to be that it does affect them greatly because. Imagine you have no real knowledge of how the outside world works. Maybe you were 15 years of doing something, but the way that humans work, the way that society works, what we know about everything. Imagine if that was all given to you in a matter of days rather than uh, over the course of 20 years. It would affect your personality greatly. It makes sense, too, because it's kind of a way of quick starting them into human culture. Mm, and yeah. it's better to give them someone who's lived a whole life than it is a child. Yeah. Yeah. I would also imagine that the people who are towards the end of life, they're vetted way more extremely than, say, some of the younger ones or, or some of the some of the ones for second, third, fourth, et cetera, fusions. It's a matter of, oh, no, the first one, let's make sure that we get the best and brightest on that first one and not some psychopath who's just been, you know, like because yeah. you don't want your your young, impressionable quill literally learning from a penitentiary. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's also to get them ready. Like, who knows how m- much longer this host really has to live, but it's to get them ready to this is how it feels when your host dies. Oh, that's oh, wow. actually that's really important. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like how it's backwards in the sense that you start them at the end of life. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good idea. I like that. That's actually kind of interesting because uh, my cultural practice is actually in the same vein of coming of age in a lot of ways. It is actually the way that Quill are born or created in general. I wanted to take the biological aspect of the Quill out of it entirely because I was thinking about like an insectoid race, like why wouldn't there be thousands, you know, because with a typical physiological insect, they're born in clutches and, you know, clusters at dozens, if not hundreds at a time. Right. So it makes no sense that this, I almost said parasitic again, this symbiotic race is so plentiful. Like it's either they are born in clutches of dozens and then they eat each other until only one survives or there is no physiological aspect to the quill at all. And it actually brings up the idea that the quill uh, essentially don't really have a birth in a, in a physiological sense. They're essentially the same soul that just gets transferred over from place to place. And similar to the Ashenborn inhabit a pre-existing body in a lot of ways. So the idea that I had was this the quill when they when they bind themselves to their hosts, right? When their host die when they when they bind, they bind everything. Uh, physiological, you know, emotional and even their souls. So it's a matter of the quill combine souls with their hosts and infuse a little bit into each one. So when their host dies, they lose part of their soul. And that actually builds into the natural lifespan of a quill. They're longer lived based on how emotionally connected they are to their host. So for example, if you have, you know, like there's quill out there who have three to five hosts and they get really, really attached to a number of them. And because their, their fusion is so deep, that they fuse more and more of their souls together, that they have a shorter lifespan than those who are able to fuse with someone and kind of get it and then move on to the next. And so the other interesting thing about it is that because their souls move on from different host to host, you know, when their host dies, that soul moves on with part of the quill, 
And so you're getting that thing moving over to the next. And it's essentially they fuse with multiple hosts as a way to spawn, essentially, as a way to procreate, even though it's not necessarily um, procreation. Procreation, exactly. Oh, so is the fra- so the fragment that's lost from a quill soul into the into the host when the host dies becomes a seed when it's returned to the world, or essentially, essentially. a larva, its own larva. Yeah, so to yeah. then ha- do the same cycle again. Exactly. Oh, okay. And so and so it's like a cascade effect, oh, I like right? That. Yeah. yeah, and that actually brings me. And I'm sorry, Daniel. I'm going to skip you for now, yeah. but we'll come back that's to fine. it. Uh, we, the, it actually brings me to my location, which is essentially the the area that the to go back to your um the way back with the ashen board yeah. yeah it's mm-hmm. essentially a soul catcher mm-hmm. where there are sacred areas for the quill where the souls of their young essentially gather and collect it's essentially like a, a, a moth to the flame type thing but with soul energy and so this is where the little larva kind of form and mm-hmm. coalesce into a physical being and start their life anew. And, you know, you get the idea that you were saying, Chris, where they start with their first host after a while, after they're given some time to form their own personality and then continue on the cycle. That's neat. I like that. Yeah. I, I wanted to, I wanted to figure out a way that the quill could be more interesting to me on like a spiritual level. Cause I do find them to be kind of, soulless otherwise and it made more sense for me to figure out a way is why would they want to bind themselves to other people and the idea that their souls enmesh when they bind makes it more interesting because i think early on when you're introducing the concept of the quill chris one of the things you said is that sometimes they just wanted to die with their host and this is a way that they can physiologically do it it's like hey I've bonded so much with this person that I don't want to live. And it's like, my soul is ready to move on. And essentially it is a literal bonding of souls as well. And sometimes the quill move on as quill. And sometimes they are so enmeshed within the human soul or the Spriggan soul or what have you, that they move on as that race instead. It's just a richer experience for that soul to move on. They, they seem similar. What, what's, what I like about that is there's an opportunity to bridge the Ashenborn concept and there's on some higher meta level. So like if someone were, say, playing in this world or extending it, they could think, well, how does how are those two related? Because they both seem to go through the similar cycle. Exactly. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, the cycle is universal to, right. to everyone, right? So the idea that this plays into that cosmology mm-hmm. is another aspect that I wanted to play up as well. Yeah. All right, and so that so that's my location and my cultural kind of touchstone. So, uh, Daniel, why don't you go ahead and take it back? Yeah, so I I would probably need to switch to the variant because a lot of mine are related. So, if I were to okay. s- start with the variant, um, <laughs> I know everyone looking at me suspiciously because last time I made some kind of horrific uh, what were they called quill primitives. I promise they're not going to do that this time. Honestly, I'm totally oh, fine oh, with the quill being horrible <laughs> monsters. So. There's, this is kind of horrible. So, so what I had in mind was what I'm calling a gray quill or a quill, a quill intellect. So what these quill are is – so this is a sect, I would say, within the quill culture. Um, not, it's not necessarily secret, but it's, it's probably more um, selective, where the hosts that are selected – and this is probably after they've been bonded to the first, um, yeah. the first quill that, that's old that they have, first the human that's old that they have. So the first, the first real binding they have is um, they choose really intelligent children, um, so like kind of genius-level children. And they, they, the quill bind with these children um, in the hopes of um, having a superior intellect. And this particular sect develops their intellect to the point that they're able to have certain abilities as a result of it. And now where they derive those abilities from is God hearts that they secretly collect. Um, so it's a way for me to introduce into the land of a thousand gods, um, psionics. Uh. <laughs> so the idea, how here, many crystals mm-hmm. are involved here, Daniel? <laughs> so the idea here is they, the, the, there, there are keepers um, in, in the Grey Quill sect who collect these god hearts so that they can use them to attune their mental abilities. Mm. And so they're very, there's very few Grey Quill, but they're, they have certain powers similar to a god pacted uh, character would have. All right. I can, I, can, <laughs> I can agree that that exists as a thing. 
it should be noted. I am not a fan of psionics overall. Uh, I think that the best example of psionics is probably uh, occult magic in Pathfinder and whatnot. I'm thinking that, like second edition psionics. Oh, I know. You're yeah. thinking of like oh, yeah. psychic knife with like exactly. red crystals flying around your yeah. fucking head like or a like, dumbass. Not necessarily exactly visible about. things. This things is a stone that doesn't even do anything. Well, like pa- not necessarily ion stones, but which just collect spells. But but they do more than that. Thank you. <laughs> but I'm thinking like these are ones whose powers they're not like visual in any way. Like their mental abilities, but they're really what they really are, though, is God pacted powers. Okay, mm-hmm. that is a nice save to an idea that I would otherwise be like, <laughs> hold on, now you've been breaking too many rules. Well, because we don't want to break the fundamental divine rule, right? But yes. here, it's the way that they control the God pacted the God the God heart is through the power of their mind. To free speech jail with you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, you said that your variant kind of plays oh, yeah. into the. We're talking about practices. Practice. Yeah, yeah, cultural practice. So how do, how does that reflect exactly? Um, so I'm thinking, you know, one of the things that the Grey Quill do or able to do is they can do these kind of like group meditations where they're able to, quote unquote, astrally explore the past lives that they're binded with or the life that they're binded with, essentially. So they're able to essentially... Like because you've bonded with them, you're you, you're able to go back into their memories. Yes. So it's not necessarily like an astral projection. It's no. more of like a re-experiencing, you know, the previous hosts that you've had before, like the time of your binding. Well, and it's a group meditation, so you can explore the memories of others in the meditation. Oh, that can be really awkward. Yes. I I feel like ayahuasca is involved <laughs> in some way. Yeah, and it's something that is done specifically with the gray quill because they've developed their minds to such an extent. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right, Chris. We we've both kind of double dipped here, so you can you can hit us with a variant or a location if you'd like. So I had a non-starter with my variant, but I liked what you you were doing as far as their birth and everything. And I was gonna have null quill quill that weren't special, couldn't uh, join with host or anything. Oh, and hmm. so it's kind of like a special little time that one's born that it's just like, oh, this one's intelligent, sweet. Guess what? You get upgraded to get in a host. But I didn't like that as much, so I'm going to make a monster. Oh, okay. And I was going to uh, say uh, what happens when you combine Ashenborn and a quill. Ooh, weird. And Especially with the soul binding stuff, like you're stuck with it. Maybe that's why Quill immediately reject the Ashenborn is because they are stuck and so they don't get to breed, essentially. Correct, but I was going to have it be a quill that has the unfortunate of being born ashen born. So it's a beetle and they're called uh gray shells. Oh, Interesting. But neat. that was the working name and then you had to say well, gray. I like gray shells. I could just say they're quill intellects. How about mm-hmm. that? Or ghost shell. Or go yeah, there you yeah. go. Yeah. But what they do is they are rapidly trying to jump from host to host and rather than give up their soul stuff, they are siphoning it off to prolong oh. their own life. Yeah, you just made a monster race that's yes. like every variant that we've created thus far is evil. Whoa, 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 whoa. Which is why my variant Because the quill isn't. are so good. No. They no, are no, not no. evil people. Mine aren't evil. No, I know. Yeah. Also, really? Yeah. Because a psionic cult doesn't yeah. sound evil to no, me. No, they're like they're Where's, like. Where's there is a dune in this? No, they're equation. they're just like they're like the the higher level um you know librarian part of yeah. the Quill Society. I'm I'm getting yeah. like Hari Krishna vibes and not in a good way. <laughs> he, he did not say one evil thing. That I didn't they say did. cult. <laughs> you did you say sect, adopting children. Is, yes. Okay. You said sect, which is synonymous yeah. with cult. You like every religion. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Hey. All right. Not all cults are bad. Yeah, some I mean, of them just do yoga. Anyway, we're we're moving on. <laughs> Look, my variant. See, this is why I wanted to come up with a nice variant of the quill, which is why I chose mine. Which is this is a quill that when they bind with their host, they have the ability to uh, physically change parts of their host. Hmm. Now. Oftentimes, this is an expression of gender. So if a human host is looking to, for example, is fear, is feeling uh, some kind of biological disassociation between the, what their gender is and what they feel it should be, 
they have the ability to transition with the help of a quill. Now, mind you that this is a, a fairly rare instance, but it's also because they also have to prove themselves to be able to bind to the quill. But at the same time, I wanted a way to kind of add in a level of transgenderism to the whole setting because I think that's important. And also I think that with the quill, the ability to change their host is, is an important aspect as well. And it's not just, you know, gender, it can be a number of things as well. But I think I wanted to start there for that reason. So the, the host's physical expression of gender changes yes, it's, to match the, the quills. It's, gender identity it, it's, yeah. right it's it's more like the quill is like hey i'm able to change mm -hmm. an expression for you of like it's essentially like hey they can take they can sense it within the host and then they will change it over time oh i see so so does the quill essentially like kind of agendered in its natural state because i wonder so here's the, the flip side of that could be bad is let's say Quill, you're saying the quill is giving them the option, right? Yes. But if it did it like deliberately, it would then create <laughs> transgenderism in the host. Correct. You know, which yeah. would be bad. I, I'm sure that we can kind of, Oops. that we can introduce both options, mm -hmm. but I wanted it to be a general positive. And yes, to, to go off what you said, I actually do think that there the there's no traditional gender for the quill, mm -hmm. not in the way that we would necessarily understand. Yeah. yeah. So being able to change them biologically, is that a something that all quill can do or is it also uh, a rarity upon rarity i would say that it that that's actually a good question i'd say that it is uncommon amongst the quill similar to psionic ability <laughs> more common than psionic ability yes <laughs> all right and, and that's and that's my variant uh so location yeah, I think we well, got a location. Oh, I, had, left, I have right? more questions for you, though. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh. Um, so with with these these particular types of quill, like how do they fit into the society? Like how are they viewed by the rest of the society? Like are they seen differently? Are they revered? Are they like are they just treated as any other kind of quill? Like for example, I know in um, I think it's certain Indian cultures. I may be wrong. Which particular culture is there's like extra genders that are acknowledged and revered. Oh, that's yeah. Those are those are certain like native. Uh, yeah, native yeah. cultures and stuff like right. that, and yeah, that's that's actually a thing. I, I actually didn't give much thought to that as well, that would be as much, but I think it's I think it's an important question to ask. In my mind, I imagine that they that the quill, considering that they bind with hosts of multiple genders, I don't think that they'd really give a shit for right. the most part. So they're like, hey, they can do that. That's their own thing. That's cool. Right. But I think there's also a stigma amongst the quill. It's like, hey, make sure that the host is okay with that. I see. Okay. Because I think that, you know what? Let's let's build off of what you said previously. Let's say that they can, in fact, enforce it like on their own, right? Mm -hmm. So they can just do it to a person. Yeah. And then, but it's such a social stigma amongst the quill that that choice should be there. Oh, see, that's cool. I like that. Yeah, <laughs> that it's like it's that's where the enforcement comes in. It's like, hey, don't do that. That's really fucked up. Your host needs to trust you, and that is doing the opposite of that. Yeah, I love that. That, that like thing. expands like how the culture functions too. You know, like yes. now there's issues of consent they think about and all that with their ability. You know? I I think that's something that is inherent within the quill themselves is the nature mm -hmm. of consent mm -hmm. because it it matters a lot because essentially you're 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 at the end of the day, despite the symbiosis, right, you are two separate entities inhabiting the same unified body. Yeah. And I think the idea that consent plays into that is a major, major aspect to it. And that has to make me think that there are quill that at some point have had a, a falling out with their host, so to speak. And they actually kind of uh, end the bond early. They don't wait until the host dies out and I kind of want to know the ghost, the ghost cool. I bet could do that. Right. But it, uh, at one point, I think we talked about, uh, since when they combine, it becomes like a new personality in a way that if something were to be so alien to either one, it would cause some sort of schism, in which case a third personality oh, right. and a Jekyll and Hyde yeah. thing mm -hmm. might, might occur. And it's super rare. Oh, where they, yeah. where they're, I, yeah, that, I would yeah. agree. I think that's why they vet the people in the mm -hmm. bond so much in the first place, because it's important that that bond starts strong because mm -hmm. otherwise it's disruptive. 
And the, I like the idea of the Jekyll and Hyde thing where it's like you're fighting for control and that's the opposite of what the quill want. Yeah. It's the opposite of what the host wants, obviously. And going back to our Halloween episode, we had that idea that there are evil quill who are essentially possessing the bodies of unwilling hosts. Yeah. And that, if you want to get into that, that's even uh, like, that's another aspect in terms of Jekyll and Hyde. That's a really brilliant idea. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, d- all right. Damn. Uh, d- d- who, who else? Did we miss anything? What, what locations did we do? Locations. I, yes. I got mine yes. already. Yeah. Uh, did so you, Did you do your location? I haven't done one yet, but you... Uh, mine was mainly going to be uh, like the spawning pool, but I feel like oh, right, uh, okay. that is uh, canceled out by the fact of if we're doing from the souls going on. The only thing that I would take from it is I, I, I wanted the place to be like ancient looking in the in the fact that it's very natural very like it's not a built place it's more of like a naturally occurring place that's actually the idea that i had in mind as well where it's more and less like a naturally occurring hive of some kind where it just so happens to be (laughs) that's not a bad idea yeah it's not a bad idea at all yeah uh so daniel what was your location then um so I wasn't sure whether to make this menacing. I was going to, but since you were worried about my sect slash cult, I'm going to yeah. make it menacing. See, I knew I knew you were going <laughs> evil with it. I, knew I you was were going, going to. Well, because I feel like all the nations we have have some kind of, not imperialist, but conquering kind of attitude to them. And I don't know, and including the races, I don't know if there's one in the quill, so I'm going to add one. <laughs> Daniel, what nation state that exists today is not inherently expansionist or of imperialist? Course. Right. So to keep things consistent, I was thinking, well, maybe the Grey Quill, being that they're the smartest of them and the most calculating, um, have a, in, in their sect the location they have is is kind of um, kind of like an intellect fortress, if you will, where they've gathered all of these these god hearts and they use the god hearts collectively with all their mental ability to scry on other nations. So, in a sense, the Grey Quill are also trained to be spies, and they work against the other nations in that way. Okay. So, the, the NSA. Yes. The QSA, if you will. The QSA. Yep. I guess that kind of brings up the point that when it comes to nationalism, the Quill have a, have a different sense to it than humans would. Mm-hmm. Because with the Quill, it's almost like, hey, we're Quill first, and then we are you know, from the caliphate or we yeah. are from Hondasa or whatever second, you know, like they're nationalist second. That's actually an interesting idea as well, because it also kind of like, I imagine that nationalists wouldn't want to join the quill collective as a result of that as well. Mm-hmm. These, the, the quill are truly alien when you kind of think about it. Right. When I imagine the quill, um, that's just my jacket. So and I also imagine the quill like there's probably a superiority complex that comes with the ones who are in this echelon um, and that they sense, OK, we can see what's going on in places that other people can't see. So we can manipulate things politically. So their alignment with other countries, you know, has, you know, at the, in the back of in the back of their minds, they have a little bit more information than what's on the negotiating table because they're able to scry and because they have, you know, these quill agents in other countries hmm. communicating with this primary fortress. Not sinister at all. Nope. It's just statecraft. They don't necessarily need to be quill agents. They Mm -hmm. could just be, the quill agents could be the uh, handlers, as it were. Right. And then, you know, they're just having a somewhat unstable person who then decides to renounce his citizenship Mm -hmm. at an embassy. True. They may, maybe they never leave the the fortress. Maybe they do their work from there. You know, I like the idea that you could also have quill sleeper agents along with it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and now we're getting into like MK Ultra type shit. Yes, and the psionics. <laughs> uh, <laughs> le- yeah, psionics with big ass fucking quotation marks. Divine psionics. No, 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 no. I mean like divonics. Divonics. Dianetics. Fuck it's right dianetics. Divonics worked for me. All right, it's, it's dianetics. We're ending the episode on that <laughs> terrible, terrible note. Um, no, but I, I actually do think that, I do think that's rather interesting. But I, I kind of want the idea that statecraft exists without the, because that's the thing. Like, I often think that I'm going to cut this part out. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. Never mind. <laughs> well, I know. I think I know what you mean. But like for me, it's like 
it's not the the doing of the statecraft is through this. It's that that's the where they get extra information. So kind of like you know how we have governments hacking each other and gather gathering their data. Sure. Right. Like the the mechanism for doing that is a technology. Mm-hmm. So their technology for doing this is their scrying. That see that That's I, I mean, can that right. I can support more yeah. than psionics. They're not that... mind controlling or anything like that. I, right. I, I see it as like having a lot of clairvoyant abilities to use politically. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Do we have any final thoughts on the quill themselves? I bet they're really, um, really arrogant. Oh yeah. 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 I, I feel like over thought. time they would just become more and more arrogant. It was yeah. just like. Oh God! You have no idea how small your problems seem. <laughs> yes, Gets me exactly. in three hundred years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen empires rise and fall, and mm-hmm. you know what? You're not special. Actually, the ancient ones would, because that implies that they're not bonding with their hosts fully. Those who live shorter lives are implied to have lived fuller, more complete lives uh-huh. with those they love. So I suppose that the old ones are kind of looked at like. Oh, they're probably a little sociopathic. That's hilarious. Because, this is the opposite like, of what we expect from our elders. <laughs> right? Yeah. And so like, oh, not evil. No. Yeah. Yeah. Not, yeah. Not evil at all. Anyway. Because so many of them find love. That's going to do it for this episode <laughs> of World Build With Us. Um, again, I have been Rob Hilferty here with Daniel Quinn and Chris Prunty. If you want to send us a question about the quill, you can go ahead and send us an email at worldbuildwithus at gmail.com. Or you can send us a Twitter bot uh, post on the Twitter at Let's World Build. And until next time, remember that we love you very much. We hope you have a good week. Bye.